Yay, Settlemeyer. You have given us hours and hours of viewing pleasure over the years. Thank you. My pleasure, start. absolutely. Um, my theory, one of my theories, one of my crackpot theories, is that uh, starting with the generation we share, uh, that there was a refusal to grow up in a certain way. And, and that includes kind of reveling and re-reveling and subverting the, the stuff, the pop culture of our childhoods. I think that is a big part of what you're doing? I, absolutely. And I've been very fortunate to be able to find other people that think precisely the same way. From the people at um, uh, Nick at Night and Nickelodeon, who eventually went over to Cartoon Network and carried the same sensibility uh, with you know, taking these bankrupt characters like Harvey Birdman and Space Ghost and elevating them to you know, a new, reinventing them. Uh, nostalgia is a, an incredible narcotic. And you see things, how, why else would people like Scooby-Doo? There's no, there's no other reason that you, know, you could watch a cartoon like that and, 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 and enjoy it. I, it's, that's a little bit beyond my time, but I think. But I, I, I don't indulge in much nostalgia of that kind, unless and except it's weird and, and dark what you do. I mean, then I can have my cake and eat it too. Parody is a wonderful tool, especially when it comes to animation. And when, um, when I started out in animation... Uh, when I started out in animation... Um, uh, there wasn't... There, there it is. That's when I started out in animation. That's what I started on. That was Strawberry Shortcake. That is Strawberry Shortcake. And it's... She's still around, and um, now, speaking of strawberry shortcake, when you're starting out doing that and the Berenstein Bears, was that were those just oh I'm glad to have I'm young I'm glad to have these jobs I'll do the best I can or I can't wait to get out of here I I don't believe in this or that, both it, well a little bit of both it was great to be working in the industry period and it was great to be working with people who had been working at the Fleischer Studios some of them go back even to the late 1920s so I was able to be around all these people who had had all this experience. As once I finished working on like this, the, the second Berenstain Bears piece, I was looking for something to do besides just kind of grunt assistant animation work. And it was working with this fella, R.O. Blackman, that kind of changed that for me, kinda. Absolutely changed that for me, because I went from doing uh, cartoons to doing animation and working with all these different artists and translating all of these uh, different artists and designers and Seymour Quast and George Booth and, and uh, Sampe and, and that's where I truly learned how to trans, how important it was to get inside an artist's style. What comes in tow with it? What baggage does it have? And is it good for whatever idea? that you're trying and, to... And, uh, among other things that you've done, which people don't know as much as they know these famous, hilarious things you've been behind, is, is that, this kind of platform you've created to turn illust great illustrators into animators? Yeah, we open... My wife Patrice and I run the studio together, and we open the studio to, to do just that, do primarily commercials and uh, uh, be in a position to make suggestions as to what graphic design is best for whatever it is that the message is supposed to be. And uh, I, I, I really have no complaints about having done the, the SNL stuff or, or uh, any of the other uh, parody work, even though it, it isn't very well drawn. Which is part of the idea, part of the fun. Absolutely. And it's this crappy, cheap yes. 60s, 70s. I almost said it isn't very well designed. No, it's beautifully designed. It's yeah. perfectly designed. It's meant to be crappy. It's meant to be crappy. And uh, it's meant to be, in terms of the animation, crap, crappy and, and so forth. But I do so love delving into other areas. And I love the opportunity to collaborate with, in some cases, you know, on that montage, you're seeing Don Martin from Mad Magazine and, and, and all these people who were my idols. So, uh, very, very fortunate, very well, lucky. Well, and, and for instance, that Chicago Tribune piece, I, I started when I, we, we 
been talking over the last couple of weeks, and I looked at the real life, and I started watching and go, oh, okay, Chicago Tribune. But then it becomes this wonderful piece of animation. I thought I died and gone to heaven. Give me an example. How, how does that work? I mean, how do you choose that style? How do you how did how do you pitch that to the Chicago the Tribune company, not necessarily known for their enlightenment? Well, the the Trib piece came out of a piece that I had done for free with a designer named Eddie Guy, uh, uses collage and cutouts, and I'd always wanted to work with him, but I. Um, uh, this opportunity came up. He had designed posters for a, um, a children's uh, film festival. So I did it for free, and uh, right as we were finishing it, the advertising agency in Chicago said, you know, we're going to pitch the... Um, by the way, that's Alex Ross, and that's Neil Adams. Those were also two of my favorite comic book uh, artists. Anyway. Um, they said, we're going to pitch the Tribune business as an agency, Would, and, and we're thinking of using some animation. Would you like to be involved? And this is ideal, because you're in on the ground floor. And you talk like a Chicago guy. And I, and I talk like a Chicago guy, because <laughs> I come from Chicago originally. Um, so uh, we pitched, I, I did designs, and uh, we pitched it, and we got it, and like I said, it was coming from Chicago, having designed it myself, and it was transit, it was newspapers, it was doing the boxes, the trucks, the TV, the theatrical. It was just, and there was no dialogue. It was all, it was all silent Chaplin Keaton No, it's the, stuff. It's the, and it's the kind of animation you look at a piece like that from 1962 and go, oh man, look at what they used to do, this <laughs> great amazing stuff. And you did it, you know, not yeah, that long ago. Yeah. So it, it, that, was, that, that was ideal, that was wonderful. You, you mentioned uh, generously uh, and correctly your, your, your good fortune in collaborators like Robert Smigel, like Mike Judge on Beavis and Butthead, like the writers of the, Steve, uh, the Colbert Report, others. Um, what makes you decide, oh, yeah, I can't, th this is going to be fun, this is worth doing, working with this person, or, yeah, I don't think so. Well, I think I look at the challenge of doing something that maybe I hadn't done before. Um, the first thing I did with Smigel was the cluck and chicken piece. Um, and I had been talking to somebody at SNL about doing a parody of a cartoon character in a commercial. And it just so happened that Smigel happened to be the writer and the producer for it. Um, and then it went on to doing other things with, uh, he, with Conan, when Conan started his show. But when Robert sent me the script for the um, Ambiguously Gay Duo, I never laughed at a script out loud. And they thought I was kind of losing it in my room because I was in there laughing by myself. Um, it, it, it was a chance to do something that hadn't been done before. I totally got it. Uh, I had worked with Smigel before. Initially, it didn't go so well. But after we started working with each other after Cluck and Chicken, it, it worked out fine. And then once I started working with Smigel, then because Stephen does the voice for um, Ace and Steve Carell does Gary, it, it, it's this little community that I became a part of that was fantastic. Uh, and those SNL cartoons really helped change people's perception of what animation could be. And that was fantastic. And I would love to say that I knew when we embarked on it that what I, that's what I was doing. But uh, it, it, I really learned a lot about things by doing those cartoons. They were really, really fantastic. You mean in terms of comedy or in technical In terms things? of comedy, in terms of realizing that um, even though the crappiness was a part of the concept and the 70s Saturday morning cartoon stuff, um, we, we, we had other things like the real audio stuff and we do parodies of a Disney or we do parodies of a schoolhouse rock and it was really nice that we didn't have the luxury of determining what the schedule or even the budget would be because the constraints of the budget and the schedule made us work a certain way that gave it an edge that right. made them what they were. So the, really the, the, they just say here's the budget make, make uh, two minutes to work for this. Well, it, that evolved too because we had done the first cartoon for the Dana Carvey show and then before I know it we're doing these things there was no no one had done anything like this before 
And uh, so it was a matter of formulating it and seeing what we could get away with and where they could find the budget and the money. That actually, that card was budget driven because um, we had done a storyboard for a project uh, using Rudolph, Rudy Giuliani, I, yeah, and there was a plunger involved, I think. And surprisingly, they dumped the idea. So when they dumped the idea in the past, I'd say, okay, well, we've done storyboards and layouts, you know, we'll bill you for that, which I did. And they said, well, I'm sorry, our, our um, uh, policy has changed and all the payments that come from the West Coast now, uh, you can't do that, you can't do that. I said, well, what do you mean? I can't bill for something that I did? And they said, no, I'm sorry. So I went to Robert and I said, this is, this is what they're telling me. I mean, w how can I work within this and get something out of it? He said, why don't you tell them you want your own title card? Because at the end of each of the cartoons, it had an opening and then you had the credits and Smigel had his title card and he was nice enough to say, just ask for your own title card. So I called him right back up and I said, okay, well, you're not gonna pay me, then I want my own title card. And I could hear them kind of gasp. Because that's big currency in show business. Well, actually, they were saying, whatever. Oh, really? Yeah, they were, kind of, short of actually seeing them do this over the telephone, <laughs> yeah. it, was, it, it was, they were so relieved that they didn't have After to pay. Cash, yeah. yeah, so I think I did that in like 20 minutes because it had to go on a show soon thereafter and I wanted to get it and it's now I learned what branding was we stopped doing the Saturday Night Live cartoons after the third year we did them is that right everyone thinks we did them all and because of that card because of that color butterscotch <laughs> the the Captain Linger cartoon I laughed out loud uh, when I was watching that at home which I seldom laugh out loud staring at my computer. Uh, it, that's a really funny thing. And also, I think the fact that you got a laugh here from this audience, which made sense, from the two or three second delay in the titles. In the yeah. I don't think general audiences would laugh at that two no, or three they, second delay. You're right. It takes, but the squirm factor is so much fun. And I have to say, the, I did those with Stuart Hill at Cartoon Network, who is my favorite writer. Uh, to, to work with and he has this down-home swing with things and that line some of the other cartoon superheroes already don't like him yes. is the most wonderful yes. line because it captures as much awkward yes. struggle that you know Captain Linger goes through. Also some of is, yeah, is some a brilliant of, part of it. Yeah. And, and initially Stewart's idea was to do it kind of like a um, uh, uh, Dudley Do-Right but I jumped on that and I said oh this is such a great idea let's do it like those kind of early 60s DC innocuous kind of can't draw really well but can draw good enough sort of cartoons so that people look at it and are disarmed. If it looks funny people are going to feel like something funny's coming. This looks not funny. <laughs> this already, this, sometimes this already doesn't look funny. Yeah, um, which, is, which is funny. Which is funny. Um, ha, have, how often, if ever, and why, do you turn down commercial work? Very, very rarely now because so many people are, I used to turn it down because they were choosing to do animation for all the wrong reasons. Now, Which I mean, is what, cuteness? Or? Which is, uh, we want to do, as somebody's doing animation, we think we should do animation. And we want to, uh, uh, they don't understand that if you don't do it correctly, it can sabotage what it is that you're setting out to do. If I can't convince them or couldn't convince them of that, then I would back away from it. But short of doing something like, um, uh, a, a tobacco advertising or right. something. I can usually work with people, especially now, and get it to, you know, get it to work out. It's very rare that I, it's, I mostly have to turn down more work from networks and online things because the budgets are just And, and of course all the work looks, ridiculous. the work, that work looks all like traditional cell animation. Do you work in digital these days? <laughs> we did the first season of Beavis and Butthead digitally. That was, that was 20, 20 years, ago. years ago. When MTV did it right after, we only did the first season, we, we ran, ran away. Um, they did it with Cell. 
And so we've been, doing, uh, we've been doing digital for a very long time. I have done CG work. It's just not the world that I've, I'm known to inhabit. So, uh, uh, but I'm up for any, animation is anything, absolutely anything now. You're seeing films and you're seeing stuff on TV that undoubtedly has animation of some kind in it, meaning special effects or manipulation and uh, probably not even aware of it. So it's such a wonderful tool to use in so many different ways, and I wish we had more time. I do too. It's been my honor. Thank you so much, JJ. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks.